Fiona Hill, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Yasha. Great to be with you. Um, so I've really enjoyed uh, learning about your life story and, and your childhood from, from your latest book. Um, it, it, it tells the story of how uh, sort of a, a, you know, a working class girl from the north of England uh, ends up uh, getting into positions of real influence and authority an ocean away in the United States. Um, what is sort of the relevance of that beginning? What is the relevance of class in England to how you sort of experience and see the world? Well, obviously it gives me a very different vantage point. All of us bring a particular lens, right, to um, not just our own lives and the way that we interpret certain events and uh, uh, the way that we move through them, uh, but also a lens to larger affairs, how we understand the world around us. And, you know, if you get into a position like you and I are, are in, in terms of being analysts of uh, politics and uh, international affairs and foreign policy, you know, you bring that perspective to it as well. And I uh, have always uh, been very much cognizant that I've been looking for a very long time, all the way through from the bottom up. You know, I'm not a member of uh, the elite. Um, I suppose I am now, but I wasn't when I started off. I mean, there's, there's a kind of certain accident of birth that comes to it. But there's also a very much a specificity to the place and the time um, of, of my, in my childhood. Like there's for everyone, of course, but, um, you know, in this case, it was shaped by an awful lot of impersonal forces. Uh, there was a lot of interactions that I had that um, really gave me uh, a different outlook from the people that I've you know, later worked with and uh, or earlier studied alongside. I realized that I was kind of seeing and experiencing things in a very different way. I, I, I feel, you know, kind of all the way through my childhood, you know, and career that I've been an outsider, someone who was always kind of looking in and having a uh, you know, very different set of experiences. And, and part of that comes from also being a woman, uh, which is also an important element of this. Uh, and again, you know, kind of a, just um, an accident of birth, right? <laughs> That's kind of particularly choose, you know, kind of uh, like most people don't know about who I am and, you know, where I was born and the basic facts of that. And that's also very much uh, shaped uh, my interactions uh, with people as I've moved along. And so tell us a little bit about the place where you grew up, what, what its culture was and, and how, how, how that continues to sort of influence how, how you see the world. Well, it was a very distinctive place, even in the context of the United Kingdom. Um, the United Kingdom, you know, for most of the people outside, sort of seems like a fairly monolithic kind of place. People kind of think of English. I mean, okay, then they were aware of the Scots, you know, the Welsh and the Irish and having this ethnic distinctiveness. But England, um, as a political entity, has undergone a lot of changes uh, historically and has a very strong regional component that doesn't just come with you know, geography and uh, a kind of accents of history, but there's a lot of strong regional cultures. There are accents and dialects uh, that have um, emerged. There was a surprising amount of isolation. Uh, between among regions in the United Kingdom and in England, you know, for example, difficulties of travel physically, despite the small size, which may seem preposterous, you know, when people think about this. But, you know, kind of my grandparents um, had uh, not, not really left their region apart from to fight in wars. My uh, grandfather, my uh, paternal grandfather fought in World War I. And um, other members of my family had fought both World War I and World War II just by the kind of accident of, you know, the kind of the timing of their birth. Beyond that, they hadn't really travelled anywhere. I mean, what a way to, to, you know, kind of see the rest of the world, which was kind of common, I think, you know, around Europe and in, in the United States as well, particularly for people in uh, the Second World War, for example, kids who were plucked from, you know, remote farming communities in the American Midwest and then find themselves on battlefields you know, might be even in North Africa or Italy, you know, for example, quite a bit of a shock to the system all around. But the place that, um, you know, I was born in County Durham in the north of England has this very peculiar history. That was a, um, a, a principality of bishops, um, usually, you know, kind of some second son or brother of uh, the king, particularly after the Norman conquest in the UK. And had, it was kind of a world apart. The prince bishops of Durham were uh, basically uh, entrusted with guarding the frontier uh, against Scotland. Uh, they were allowed to have their own private armies and lived in you know, castles, highly fortified settlements. So it's the outer rim of the Roman Empire before that, the last outpost before Hadrian's Wall at the very end of, of Roman influence uh, throughout Europe in, the, in that part of uh, the world. 
I'm sorry, Asha, a, a helicopter is going overhead at the moment here. I don't know if you can hear that as we're speaking, but um, I just Actually, hardly the... enough, not too much, but, um, but we have a good yeah. sound editor who will yeah, we'll you know, we interrupt yeah. for a second if, if, but, if it's. But the, if other, it's the other important point about uh, County Durham before beyond this kind of interesting history, which gave it a degree of autonomy, actually, political and cultural and regional autonomy. Uh, was that it was one of the centers of the Industrial Revolution. And it was really kind of the center of coal mining and then all the associated industries that came from there, the, the development of the first railways. There were freight railways for transporting coal, um, steelworks, you know, shipbuilding on the coast and the export of uh, coal from major ports for the, for the first passenger railway. And so it was very distinctive in then becoming a centre in which people from all over from the rest of uh, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, moved to Welsh, Scots, Irish, people coming up from the further part of the south of England to work in the coal mines and the shipyards and the factories and the steelworks uh, that grew up around this. And then, you know, kind of in the aftermath of World War II, um, all of that industry had to be nationalised because of the impact of uh, the war, the dislocation effects, private sector couldn't really recover, the government set, set in. And this is kind of really sort of the beginning of the end, although there was this massive rebuilding after World War II, all the industries in the region were nationalised. So this became, you know, kind of very much the influence of the state. Everybody was working for the public sector, essentially. And uh, the uh, commercial uh, aspects of, uh, the, of uh, the industries uh, really took a hit. And you start to see sort of a massive decline in that kind of period after World War II, even during rebuilding. And so in the kind of period in which, you know, I'm born in, in the 1960s, by that time, a lot of the industries are in trouble. Uh, they're no longer profitable. The world is moving on. There's a modernization. We're moving to the new knowledge economy, more automation. Um, and the industry is in dire need of an overhaul. And when Margaret Thatcher comes into office as prime minister in the United Kingdom in 1979, she launches a mass privatization campaign and the modernization of British industry. And it's a privatization of all this heavy industry. And you get um, in the 1980s, hundreds of thousands of people suddenly laid off all at once. So my region goes, you know, the course of a century from being the cradle uh, and the source of innovation uh, for the industrial revolution uh, to basically the source of mass unemployment. Uh, in uh, the UK, from you know the, the bastion of heavy industry to um, you know the bastion of impoverished working class. My father was a coal miner from many generations of coal mining, and I you know kind of am, am basically growing up in an atmosphere of uh, unemployment and uh, limited prospects. Um, I, I think there's sort of two really interesting things about this. One of which is that uh, you grew up in a community that I think has sort of some of the most uh, extreme uh, and positive forms of working class culture, right? Which is to say, uh, coal mines, uh, steelworks, etc., often had the strongest sense of collective solidarity, of of, of a kind of uh, positive earned identity derived from the jobs that people uh, carried out. And it, from your description of it, it seems to me that at the time when you were growing up, it was in this weird limbo state where actually the sources of it weren't around anymore because the coal right. mines, most of them had closed down, the steelworks were closing yep. down. Um, but, the, but, but the cultural overhang of it was still really, really strong, right? Absolutely. So yeah. so because of these generations of, of history of this, people still identified as coal miners, as, as being members of a working class. Um, and, and that seems to have gone away now. I had Douglas Alexander. Uh, the, the Scottish politician yep. uh, on the podcast uh, a little while ago, and he was telling me that when he was campaigning for the Labour Party in the last election, um, he felt like they were offering people a trip to the mining museum, but they wanted to go to Euro Disney. So sort of, you know, a few decades on, not yep. only the material base of that culture is gone, but the culture itself is gone. So I guess, um, you know, what does it do to a country to see, first of all, the sort of, source of pride in that working class culture erode, and then perhaps a little while later, the working class culture itself erode, if, if you agree with, with Douglas on this point. I do agree. And, you know, I know him well. And, you know, obviously the constituents that he represented in Scotland is uh, very similar. And people, you know, became in many respects trapped in the past. I mean, it's one of the reasons I myself became extraordinarily interested in history, because I was trying to explain to myself as a kid what was going on and what had happened. Why was it that I was kind of living in this, um, you know, kind of decaying infrastructure 
uh, you know, I had the, there's a very strong sense of use of community and culture derived from the workplace. I mean, you really see how, you know, a particular form of work can manifest itself in culture, language. Uh, a language had grown up around the coal mines. Uh, there were various dialects with even given names in the north of East of England. And in uh, the Durham coal fields, there was a language that the miners spoke and their family spoke called Pitmatic from the pits. And, uh, you know, a lot of it is kind of uh, various different kind of common uh, references to tools that they would use, you know, kind of uh, the kind of the practices that are kind of built up, the words that weren't used anywhere else in the country, you know, for example. And uh, again, there was all kinds of pastimes, people had their own songs, their own uh, uh, cultural clubs from uh, soccer teams to uh, reading and writing circles and uh, sketching circles. They produced famous artists and writers, you know, for example. People had come from around the world. I mean, what struck me as a kid was reading about these famous Soviet writers like Yevgeny Zamyatin, somebody who I later studied, you know, who'd come to, you know, basically the northeast of England to understand it. Uh, George Orwell, you know, his, his book about the to Wigan Pier, he was writing about his time with miners, uh, not just in sort of Yorkshire and the kind of uh, Midlands, but also in uh, the northeast of England. You know, so this was kind of a very storied uh, um, uh, place, uh, lots of uh, political focus on it as well. The Durham miners used to actually set the agenda of the Labour movement in the United Kingdom and also the political movement within the Labour Party. And then they were basically a backwater. And trying to explain this for yourself and uh, the impacts of this, that really kind of set me, I think, on something of my own personal odyssey of uh, trying to sort of understand these larger phenomenon, you know, what had happened and, uh, and where we were heading. It also really reinforced uh, regional divides in the United Kingdom because the North and County Durham um, in particular had been so associated with heavy industry and mass manufacturing. It was also associated with being uh, dominated by the working class. Uh, and, you know, kind of the middle classes it would be in the United States. And that was kind of very different, um, you know, from other parts of England, particularly in the South, where you didn't really have, of course, you had workers and A lot of those jobs are all moving to the south. And so there becomes this kind of sense of that kind of forgotten place, a place, as you said, in limbo, um, as a kind of a, a sense of decay and a kind of, a, as you said, almost like a mining museum uh, phenomenon about the north of England. And people do become kind of like trapped into that perspective. Um, and so what's your story of how you end up moving out of that community, um, studying among others in, in, in Moscow and, and, and at Harvard? Um, and sort of in, in, in which ways did you have to grapple with the fact of coming from a working class background as you, you know, joined in the broader sense, the political elite today? Well, first of all, the title of the book is There's Nothing For You Here, which is what my dad said to me, you know, when it became obvious that I was, um, you know, doing well enough at school that I would be able to apply to university. And of course, my parents really wanted me to do that. Um, my dad had left school at 14. His education had been cut short repeatedly. He'd been pushed to go down the mines and not continue with schooling. My mom had left school a bit later at 16 and gone to train as a nurse, but neither of them had had the kind of educational opportunity that were actually expanding and opening up in the period um, after I was born in the 1960s. And my local education authority would pay all of the fees and provide a maintenance grant for students like myself from poor backgrounds, first um, in the family to go to university and who had got you know, the requisite school qualifications and ability to study at university. So when that became obvious that I could do that, my parents were really pushing me to. And but my dad had said to me, look, you know, if you get these qualifications, you won't be able to come back here again. There's nothing for you here, pet. You know, you're going to have to start thinking about, you know, what else you do and where else you go. And the reason I started studying Russian was very much the timing. It wasn't just this sort of timing of this economic collapse related to, the, you know, the move away from heavy industry and mass privatization and, you know, modernization that was going on in, uh, in the UK at the time. But it was also the time of all the war scares, the peak of the Cold War, the... Um, so-called Euro missile crisis that went from 1977 to 1987, so spanning my whole um, you know, teenage years and my first years at university. 
And the whole idea that um, the Soviet Union and the United States could get into a nuclear confrontation, the different placements of missiles and staging of new missiles in, in Europe, you know, for example. And I uh, decided to study Russian as a kind of almost a sort of a practical response to this to try to figure out, you know, kind of if we were literally going to be facing nuclear Armageddon, why? <laughs> I had a, a kind of an older cousin of my father, my uncle Charlie, who I talk about in the book, who said to my dad one day, you know, your Fiona's good at languages. I'd been studying French and German. I'd go on school exchanges. Said she should study Russian and try to figure out why they're bloody well trying to blow us up. Because he'd, and during World War II, he'd been in the Atlantic convoys supplying uh, the Soviet Union from the UK and Canada and the United States during the height of World War II and wondered why we'd been once wartime allies and now seem to be um, implacable enemies. You know, what had gone wrong here? And so this is another set of questions, you know, my personal questions of what happened in, to uh, the, uh, the economic and social history. I mean, how did, you know, we go from being the crucible of the Industrial Revolution to the crucible of unemployment? And then, you know, why was it that the relationship with the Soviet Union had deteriorated so much in the time frame from you know 1945 onwards and so I decided to study Russian and I think well maybe I'll become an interpreter you know maybe on the outside because you know I'm from the working class I don't have much sense of you know what I can do with this but I could try right to do something I could be an interpreter I knew those were jobs so I thought well maybe I could join the foreign service and I could maybe be a, a diplomat you know and maybe I could help you know in some way to kind of figure out you know negotiations that you know, was a kind of there was that naivety and that kind of thought that maybe I could do this. And I got a chance to go to St. Andrews University in Scotland where I could take Russian from scratch because Russian was not available in my um, uh, in the schools in my hometown. But of course, there were a lot of obstacles. Uh, there was all discrimination against people like me. Only five to six percent of kids in the UK in any uh, circumstances, different socioeconomic circumstances, class circumstances, went to university. So, you know, the likelihood of a person from a working class background going to university was slim anyway. And, you know, kind of following this career path seemed unlikely. I also didn't have all of the money necessary for all the studies. There was all kinds of other things I would have to do beyond just having the fees paid at St. Andrews and a maintenance grant for housing. You know, I didn't have money for all the other essentials, books and, you know, kind of uh, uh, other studies, internships, summer programs. I would have to take intensive Russian. And that's when I kind of started on this sort of odyssey that I describe in the book, the kind of book of the theme is opportunity. Sometimes you have opportunities, but you can't take them because you don't have the wherewithal to do so. And, you know, I had to then be very creative. And also I was very lucky in finding sources of additional funding. The Durham Miners Association gave me some uh, money. My local Rotary Club, the Business Association, you know, for example, did friends, relatives, neighbours. You know, I had all kinds of mentors and benefactors who stepped up to try to make it possible for me to uh, basically pursue education beyond you know the fact of going to university I was very for fortunate to get grants and fellowships lots of things that I was able to take advantage of disappeared after that you know there was time specific and you know that was kind of later when I reflect back and I think about that journey that I took that trajectory that move it's not that feasible for people so the things that I did are not uh, you know uh, so easy to do they weren't at the time but now they are more impossible for people from similar kinds of backgrounds that's interesting i i I've thought about that in, in my own story i come from in many ways a middle class family my mom is a musician but one that's economically uh you know there was better times and worse times as, as is often the case of artists um and i i went to study in england um back when tuition fees were about a thousand pounds a year and that was something that my family could afford yeah. um tuition fees where they are now i think the easiest course of action would have been to stay in germany and that's, exactly. that's likely what we would have ended up doing certainly it never occurred to me that as an undergraduate because uh, in retrospect i realized that perhaps i may have been able to find some fellowship or something like that but at the time i just knew sort of that at that time i guess tuition fees would have been 30 something thousand dollars and that just yeah. seemed you know, completely impossible. Um, uh, so then you, you you end up going for graduate study in the United States. And, and one of the themes of the book is the sort of two different lenses through which to look at the world. Class, which seems in many ways dominant in Britain, for perhaps it sometimes conceals the exactly. importance that race hmm. plays in Britain. But then race in the United States, which is the primary uh, 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 sort of social 
or at least the most salient social stratification in the United States, but perhaps sometimes somewhat conceals the importance of class also plays in America. Exactly, yeah. And that's deliberate, of course, right, too, because, you know, there, there were efforts, including in Britain that I described in the book, but are very well discussed in other works, you know, for example, to, you know, kind of remove, um, you know, some of that class solidarity on a socioeconomic, you know, basis that would have otherwise emerged in, the, you know, the broader labor movement in the UK and the United States by playing up, you know, kind of racial and other differences. Yeah, and so so how did your perception of of sort of these two different uh, forms of stratification and the way that they interrelate uh, sort of change and evolve as it came to know the United States? Yeah, well, in the UK, I was kind of unaware of it, really. Um, you know, I describe in the book, you know, kind of growing up in a pretty, you know, predominantly white environment. Um, uh, race just was not an issue in my home region because, you know, 98 plus percent of uh, the population were white British. White British is now um, a term that's kind of been used in the last 10 years, but when I was you know, kind of growing up, it wasn't really something that was kind of thought about. But we did think about in ethnic terms. You know, my family were a mishmash of um, English, Scottish, Irish, Welsh, and traveller, those lowland Scottish travellers. There's actually a whole category um, of travellers, uh, Roma, um, Royal Romanichal um, uh, travellers, um, you know, very distinct ethnic group, but also Irish travellers, Welsh travellers, Lowland Scots travellers, for example. So, you know, there was a kind of an ethnic and religious, you know, differences between Catholic and Protestants, you know, which were very real um, distinctions in the United Kingdom. But it was only in really big cities and in London where, you know, the racial dimension uh, was uh, you know, uppermost. And in the 1980s, that was really kind of starting to come to the fore. But not where I was living, we were kind of watching this, observing it from afar. So when I get to the United States in 1989 and they come to Boston, it's a real shock to the system. It's instantaneous, um, you know, uh, unavoidable. And I'm, you know, playing catch up because I mean, obviously I knew a little bit about American history and I'd read about the civil rights movement, but I was not expecting, you know, what I encountered in, in Harvard. And I had a crash course, as I describe in the book, in American race relations in my first weeks there. Um, I, I had not realized that I was kind of coming into a Boston and a you know, larger environment around Harvard that was badly scarred by the efforts that had been undergoing um, since the 1970s to desegregate the Boston public school system and busing kids from you know, different neighborhoods uh, to try to do so. And it had had the exact opposite effect from you know what was um, uh, intended, um, the, the uh, white public schools was supposed to be desegregated. Ended up being all black, or predominantly black, as kind of white uh, you know Bostonians just decided to leave these neighborhoods and go to school or move into the suburbs. So it was kind of you know a total mess, and uh, it had been an incredibly fraught, at times violent, and uh, you know altogether. Um, as I said, uh, sort of uh, the exact opposite of what has been intended through the various court orders. And of course, this has been happening across the country, but it was particularly acute in Boston. I found that Boston was a particularly, as well, segregated on so many different levels, religious, ethnic, racial. You know, I was quite shocked. Um, you know, I hadn't lived anywhere like that before. Of course, I was very well aware of the distinctions of you know, my Welsh and Irish and Scottish you know, and ancestors and friends and relatives. But here in Boston, there were whole neighborhoods. Uh, that wasn't the case in a small town like Bishop Bond, where everybody was working the coal mines or in you know, factories and things together. And you know, suddenly, um, this was not the America I was thinking of. I was thinking of the great melting pot, land of opportunity, where everyone was, you know, kind of equality, you know, fairness. It had been the kind of like the beacon for you know my family. And so I'm finding that it's not quite, <laughs> it's not quite that. And at Harvard itself, you know, kind of there was a great effort on the part of the university to diversify the student body. But it was a kind of work in progress and there was all kinds of tensions that I, that I was witness to. So immediately I start to realize that there are all kinds of these different layers here and I need to educate myself. And gender comes into the picture in ways that I hadn't really been thinking about. Of course, I mean, I was a girl. I knew I was a girl at home and there was all kinds of horrible sexism. And, you know, I described some of this in the book. But I didn't think about how it would play in the work for, workplace, for example, because I've been so focused on class and, you know, the kind of the class determinations of really my opportunities when I was living in the UK. And I'd never lived in the UK in anything other than a working class environment.
And I hadn't thought about, you know, women in a different kind of workplace, in a professional workplace, for example, or in academia, for obvious reasons. So, uh, and so one, one of the things that you've been really interesting about is that actually this, this lack of opportunity for various groups in different contexts and the resentment of this is one of the drivers of populist politics. It's one of the things exactly. that explain why this populist power. So, you know, I, 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 how is it that politicians that are often quite elite themselves, um, whether it's Boris Johnson in the United Kingdom or whether it's Donald Trump in the United States, and there's many other examples in places around the world, like Silvio Berlusconi in Italy, for example, yeah. are able to effectively tap into this uh, sort of resentment uh, in a way that actually is politically efficacious? How is it that this lack of opportunity translates into electoral victories by people who often are very much born as members of the elite? Well, look, it's some, um, you know, all of these three people that you mentioned there was interesting. I mean, you mentioned Johnson, Berlusconi and Trump. I mean, you know, definitely, um, uh, part of the elite, but you know, all three of them are entertainers in some respects, right? Showman. Um, Berlusconi owned a um, whole TV and media and communications company. Trump emerges not just as a celebrity businessman, but as a celebrity reality TV, a real life celebrity. His um, whole rise to the top is through reality television. And Boris Johnson is a journalist who also, you know, kind of has a very quick wit, um, you know, kind of a bit of a flair for stand up comedy, improvisational comedy. Um, he um, obviously has been well trained as an orator, orator um, in uh, the kind of context of coming from Eton and uh, the you know various clubs and the debating societies as part of at Oxford, um, <clears throat> and um, all three of them, you know, kind of in a way have a chameleon uh, quality to them that they can kind of adapt their personas to uh, the, the people that they're interacting with. And they have a kind of a feel for politics. They are, in some respects, political geniuses, I guess, until they're not, right? But they kind of, uh, they, they, they have a knack for feeling the moment and feeding into the grievances. For Berlusconi and um, Trump, I think they kind of felt themselves disrespected in larger society. Put, uh, Johnson is a kind of a part of the whole society. He's part of the elite. He kind of knows what makes it tick, but he's able to kind of, you know, through this kind of gift for comedy and kind of like self-deprecation and, you know, kind of a certain warmth about him. I mean, he's got a kind of a warmth and empathy on his external, uh, you know, uh, interactions with people. He's able to kind of engage um, with people and get them engaged with him. He's engaging and entertaining. And I think that's kind of part of an element of it as well. They're extremely good retail politicians. So they're tapping into the grievances, they're channeling them, they're telling people they're going to fix them. But there's an entertainment quality that I think we can't um, underestimate. And part of that is kind of like a bread and circuses approach. You know, I mean, you know, one of the things that, you know, kind of feel like when you're aggrieved and, you know, world is not going in your direction, having some distractions, some entertainment, you know, I've talked about this in the communities, you know, people were, you know, really into soccer and or football, you know, it's kind of obviously in the north of England into, you know, kind of other kind of pastimes, you know, so kind of to distract themselves, divert themselves, you know, kind of in, in a way, you know, Berlusconi, Trump and, you know, Boris Johnson are feeding into that as well. They're providing entertainment, you know, you're on their team, you're on their side, they're going to be the champion for you, they're going to go out there and fight for you, they're going to do things for you, but they're going to engage with you and they're listening and hearing you, they're not kind of talking at you, they're engaging with you. They're not providing, you know, anything in detail in terms of plans and proposals for solving problems, but they're making kind of people feel like they're connected and that they matter. Yeah, I think it, I think there is something very interesting about the way in which Trump and Berlusconi and many populists in particular, who well, it's interesting as a point out, but it's not true of Johnson, um, you know, have a genuine hatred for the quote unquote true members of the elite. Right. That I think is similar to the resentment that people lower down the social scale might feel. They understand I mean, it, yeah. Yeah, somebody, uh, you know, like Berlusconi um, never felt accepted by sort of the intellectuals in Italy or the sort of uh, old money in Italy or the aristocrats in Italy. And so he was kind of um, uh, resentful of that. Um, and and that resentment was, was quite genuine. And it may have been similar to a resentment that somebody in a mid-sized provincial town in Italy 
um, who is, you know, lower middle class might feel against this sort of notables of a town who might look down on that person or something. It's like, like the role of comedy, right? If you think about this, I mean, I haven't really talked about this, um, but in the context of the book, I mean, you know, people in the north of England, a lot of gallows humor, they're very funny. So, you know, kind of one of the things after I'd written the book and, you know, kind of, uh, or before I'd written the book, actually, when I first emerged in public life and I made comments about how I'd be discriminated against by my accent, people would say, well, that's ridiculous. There are plenty of people with Northern accents. And they'd then start listing a whole host of entertainers, particularly comedians and actors and actresses and people who are in music. And I said, well, that's the point. You know, kind of when you were marginalized, um, I mean, your family, you know, were musicians, it probably doesn't kind of always hold true, but, you know, kind of, um, if you're not in the elite, you know, kind of of uh, the um, arts and culture, you often go into the, um, you know, the sort of entertainment world and, you know, the gallows humor, the making fun of this, the self-deprecation, it's a kind of a, in a way, it's a defense mechanism, but it's also kind of an act of resistance. And, you know, you're making fun of other people. You can sort of say things that are really unacceptable in other context, but if you're doing them because of comedy and you're kind of calling people out. And that's really kind of what Berlusconi and, you know, Trump are doing particularly. Trump is pretty funny. I mean, in an outrageous, you know, sense, but he's no different from a stand-up comedian. And if you look in the UK uh, context, an awful lot of the stand-up comedians, also in the United States, you know, come from marginalized cultures and they get to say things to people that they couldn't otherwise. You know, Boris Johnson doesn't do that. I mean, because he's from the elite. He plays a sort of self-deprecating, you know, kind of buffoon. He's not a buffoon at all. He's extraordinarily clever. And this is part of his, you know, shtick. And Trump's genius comes through being honed uh, in reality television. Mm. And, you know, being able to say things in a bombastic, you know, funny, he always says he's joking when he's actually not. But he says things in, you know, such a such a way. And Berlusconi did an awful lot of that as well. well and look, and I, you know, kind of found in my own family, uh, you know, they were raconteurs, they would joke, they would always joke. They, they had the kind of black gallows humour. It was the way of dealing with everything when, you know, things were uh, stacked against you. And there's an also a kind of a big element, you know, just to put it kind of more crudely, of people like, you know, again, not Boris Johnson, because he's got a different way of dealing with this, but Berlusconi and Trump giving everyone the big middle finger, you know, the kind of the rude gesture. And, you know, that that really resonates for people from marginalised. I mean, I got sick of being talked down to and told I was this and that and the other. And you find yourself wanting to kind of, you know, say something back again uh, in a cutting way and kind of bring them down to size. And comedy can do that you know, that hard edge um, entertainment and comedy. And, and politicians can do that for you, right? I think a lot of the exactly. appeal of the populists is not that you necessarily like them, not that you even necessarily agree with them, but that, you know, they really annoy the people whom I hate. And if the yes, people exactly. who I hate- exactly, they're going people, after them. Yeah, and they're calling right. them out, yeah. Um, so you uh, do your graduate study at, 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 at Harvard, a master's and a, and a PhD, and many sort of bounce around in, 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 in a sort of you know, relatively typical fashion between sort of nice think tank jobs and stints in government. Uh, and then you're asked to join the government of uh, Mr. Trump. Um, uh, tell us about that moment and uh, sort of how you, how you thought about whether or not you should join the government and, and what your experience in government was like. Well, it was a bit of a shock, actually. I never anticipated it. I mean, I don't think in my wildest <laughs> dreams I would have expected, you know, to end up in this particular administration. Um, I'm um, not a political person, not partisan. I've never been on a campaign, you know, so even work in any administration would be unusual, honestly, in a political appointment. I had been in um, the government as a national intelligence officer, very much a professional expert position um, under the George you know, W. Bush um, administration and into the first year of the Obama administration. But really, that was incidental, if that makes sense. It wasn't I was hired by the administration. I was hired by the entity of the National Intelligence Council. And I was plucked out um, of Brookings, um, uh, the institution, the think tank that I've been, been affiliated with for two decades. And I was on loan. In this instance, um, I ended up, you know, kind of coming to the attention of a couple of people who had been in and around the campaign for Trump because of this previous work in the National Intelligence Council. So my work at the... Um, uh, at Brookings and the book I'd written uh, with uh, my colleague Clifford Gaddy on Putin, you know, Mr. Putin operative in the Kremlin. And it was a direct response to the Russia's efforts to interfere in the 
2016 election and you know kind of trying to you know figure out how to respond to this and I was supposed to be asked to come in you know with the express idea that I would sit down with Trump which of course was not a far-fetched it turned out to be and sit down and explain Putin to him well of course that never happened he wasn't interested at all in hearing from you know me middle-aged woman you know might have written a book about uh, Putin irrespective of my background and you know uh, what I had to say he wanted to sit down with Putin himself and um, he had an entire you know kind of people like Rex Tillerson the former CEO of Exxon Mobil who's Secretary of State was supposed to make the introduction for him which will affect that uh, meeting with Putin but that was the general idea and look for me what had happened in 2016, the national security crisis that uh, of uh, a, a really sophisticated Russian old style, frankly, you know, Cold War propaganda and influence operation that had just metastasized and kind of you know, gone out of all control because of the effects of social media, the particular acute vulnerability of the United States, that kind of operation, that specific time. The chaos of the um, presidential election, in any case, this was a really unusual and very vitriolic um, election. 17 different you know, candidates for the Republican Party. You know, nobody expected Donald Trump to emerge out of that. You know, if Hillary Clinton in a standoff with Bernie Sanders, who wasn't even you know, part of the Democratic Party, a self-styled socialist independent senator. And Trump you know, wasn't at all of the Republican Party. He just kind of joined out of expediency you know, because he wanted to run for president. I mean, he could have run as an independent. He could have even perhaps at, if it hadn't been uh, Hillary Clinton in the mix and Bernie Sanders you know, tried to go to be a, uh, as a Democratic candidate because he had at one point been a registered Democrat. So this was kind of a wild ride, uh, you know, kind of a perfect story storm and in the midst of it you know the Russians had decided to kind of leap in there and intervene it created a domestic disaster in the United States um, as we're all well aware of and we're still living through the consequences of it and when I got asked I felt like I had to do something so I felt really strongly I had to do something I just wasn't expecting to be asked uh, just just to double down for one moment on, on this element of it, because I think there's now a lot of confusion about it. And frankly, I'm somewhat confused about it, which is... Well, I'm confused uh, too, you know, a lot of the time too, and all the different dimensions <laughs> of it, because there was so much happening all at once and unpacking it was very difficult. Right, and, but particularly around the sort of Russia piece, um, because I think, uh, you know, it's obvious to me that Russia attempted to intervene in the election. It's not obvious to me how much of an impact exactly. that actually had. Right. It's obvious to me that uh, Trump and the campaign were very receptive to various forms of aid. It's yep. not obvious to me how much of a difference that made. Um, and then, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's obvious to me that uh, some of the narrative around what had happened went well over rails and that some Absolutely. of the stuff speculated about after 2016 in retrospect yep. is really quite embarrassing for, for the media, uh, but it's not obvious to me how much that should matter. So, you know, can you give us a, a sort of three minute summary yeah. of how, you know, 50 years from now, a history book may, may cover in a couple of pages, uh, speaking as a historian, uh, easy little task, um, uh, you know, they cover what the stakes were in the Russian interference, what happens, what didn't happen, what mattered, what didn't yeah. matter. Well, look, there, I'll just focus on two facets of this, which I think, you know, kind of can help us, you know, as we look forward, because as I said, there are so many confusing details and them, sort of, you know, kind of, I find myself in the middle of, and, you know, it's hard to make sense of them all, but there are, there are two issues here. First of all, it's the fact that Russia interfered. And as you said, it's also a fact that people in and around Trump's campaign are quite willing to take information um, from any you know, kind of uh, sources that would help um, the campaign in you know, their pursuit of winning and you know, certainly defeating Hillary Clinton. And it's also you know, the case that the um, Clinton campaign you know, were doing some of their own you know, dirty politics as well, but the Russians were gunning for Hillary Clinton. We have a lot of information about this from all kinds of different sources. It's not a fact, though, that the Russians affected the actual outcome of the election. And although you know there are people who've written about this, and you know people have suggested that that's the case, I think it's an extraordinarily high um, uh, bar. Uh, you know, first of all, to achieve. And it's also extraordinarily difficult to basically say that 70,000 plus people in, you know, three counties and three states that swear the Electoral College in favour of um, Donald Trump, because, of course, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, were persuaded by Russian propaganda or by 
the um, fictional uh, created personas that uh, Russian operatives created on platforms like Twitter and Facebook or Twitter bots and things like this. So uh, Donald Trump was elected by real Americans who were you know, pushed by their own um, you know, personal political preferences, I think is the best way to put this. But it is also a fact that the perceptions of that intervention and the facts of that intervention, because the Russians did <clears throat> interfere, had a huge impact on our domestic politics. And the way in which this was, um, excuse me, sorry. <clears throat> and the way in which, as you describe, it played out in the media. So it becomes a domestic political mess, the idea of Russian intervention, and it shapes uh, everybody's reactions. And Russia becomes, you know, for the first time, you know, uh, since the Cold War, uh, an issue in our domestic politics. And the whole way that we um, act in our politics is shaped by various people's perceptions of what they think happened or didn't happen in the course of 2016. And we're still dealing with that. You know, we're still reading, dealing with the fact that the president thinks that there was a Russia hoax, um, that the, you know, the Russians didn't intervene, um, and people trying to prove that. Well, they did intervene. It was an actual fact. And we're still kind of trying to, you know, kind of uh, deal with lots of actions that people took in response to those perceptions. And in fact, we put off addressing the deep-seated grievances and problems within um, American politics as a result of a big argument about what Putin did or didn't do and what Trump and the campaign did or didn't do in 2016. And it's also Trump's perception that um, you know, many Democrats were trying to unseat him after being elected because of you know, the kind of uh, their views and what the Russians did or didn't do in cahoots with his campaign that um, uh, really kind of shaped his own view that you know, the election, that there was an effort to get rid of him and that then he has a right to himself, you know, to try to <clears throat> uh, retain power, you know, later on by all kinds of different means, because he's already been attacked by people trying to impeach him and try to get rid of him right from the very beginning. So, I mean, we end up in an absolute bloody mess, <laughs> to put it bluntly, you know, in a very British term, you know, as a result of what happened in 2016. Even the Russians themselves can't quite believe the impact that it had. And I would, you know, kind of say that in my interactions with the Russians in my NSC job, they couldn't just get their heads around it. They thought, you, you guys went mad. You know, we did what we always do in the Cold War, but they didn't actually, you know, and they said, you know, this is kind of what you would do to us. And actually, we wouldn't have done. I mean, we weren't hacking and releasing all the people's emails all over the place. We didn't actually interfere in the way that they said, you know, kind of that we did in their elections, I mean, the way that they did in ours. We haven't tried to tip the scales, you know, kind of, you know, we've gone out of that business, um, although they've seen us, you know, in their view, do it in all kinds of other places. And so they just couldn't understand how they'd become so toxic and, you know, how our politics had just gone so derailed. And they kept expecting us just to get over it, you know, and get on with, you know, kind of the, the usual kind of stuff of US-Russian relations. And of course, we couldn't. That's absolutely fascinating. So your, 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 your counterparts were sort of somewhat dumbfounded by it and were they gloating about it or were well, they were gloating initially and then they kind of got a bit perturbed by it and they thought well, what's the matter with you because they thought it was all just a pretense and I kept having to try to say to them look you have no idea everybody in the United States hates you even the people who are publicly saying something different now because you made such a mess in our politics and they would say to me are you telling us that you're a banana republic that you kind of like we can make such a mess in your politics but in fact, they did, right? Because, you know, an awful lot of people, it was, they couldn't accept that Trump had been elected. So it was very convinced that the Russians did it. <laughs> I've even actually got this postcard that somebody sent me recently saying, you know, Putin did it. You know, this kind of whole idea that Russia did it. But it's kind of a, a very convenient, um, you know, kind of way of, you know, kind of explaining what's for you the inexplicable because you haven't been paying enough attention to what's happening in domestic politics, right? And then, you know, there's kind of, Others who just, you know, can't accept that Russia did anything because of just the kind of whole political nature in which this kind of played out. And, you know, the, we can't have any kind of collective action uh, in terms of a sort of response to dealing with Russia. And the Russians also wanted Trump to indeed be able to engage on a, um, a normal political footing to have summit meetings and have arms control. And they couldn't understand why we were always going on and on about 2016 and how, you know, kind of um, meetings would get derailed right away at the kind of very beginning. And of course, they tried to play into that at first. After a while, they just got frustrated. And you can see by the kind of the end 
of the Trump administration. The Russians were, you know, almost in some respects eager to have Biden on board in terms of being more predictable. So at least they could get, get on with, you know, having some deals on arms control or having summit meetings. Now, of course, we've got it derailed again over Ukraine. And I would also argue that that's part of a reaction to, you know, what happened as well, because Trump tries to privatize Ukraine uh, foreign policy. Um, as part of the whole aftermath of 2016, to have Ukraine blamed for intervention somewhere, to have U Ukrainian um, leadership open up, you know, all kinds of investigations. This is where it all gets so confusing into Joe Biden and his son Hunter Biden as he's trying to kind of hobble the competition in the 2020 election. And when the United States gets back to its usual foreign policy, national security businesses, we are reaffirming the sovereignty and independence of Ukraine. But Russians freak out. I think we're about to bring Ukraine into NATO. Next thing, we have a massive confrontation over Ukraine. It's all kind of rooted in this mayhem and this maelstrom of the perfect storm of politics and Russian intervention that we get in 2016. And I think, you know, historians have been writing about this forever. Your explanation is absolutely fascinating because it both doesn't overstate the extent of Russian interference in the way that I think some of the shoddy journalism and, and takes have done, and yet shows how it is actually in a deep way at the root of, 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 of a lot of different kinds of rot that we now see in our political system. That's, that's, that's absolutely fascinating. Yeah, and it wasn't um, what the Russians that... intended, you know, I mean, I think it was just like this ricochet, you know, kind of effect. Right, right. And we all, we did go mad, you know, it was collective, you know, kind of insanity as a result of it, because it was like, it was like a nine, it was like 9-11 when we did as well because nobody would have expected it to, them to have such an impact. And, you know, really some of the things that they did had a huge impact, the hack and release of um, the emails for Hillary Clinton and the DNC. But ultimately, you know, as the Russian ambassador <laughs> said to me once, you know, they didn't invent some of the other, you know, kind of consequences of this. They, they, were, they didn't force Jim Comey to decide to go back into the emails. You know, rather, you know, crudely, you know, at one point, you know, one of um, the senior Russians said we didn't, you know, we didn't invent Anthony Weiner. You know, we didn't put those emails on his server. You know, so this is, you know, of course, poor, you know, Huma Abedin's now, you know, ex-husband who gets, you know, snarled up, you know, from his own, you know, impropriety and, um, you know, an excusable behavior. But they find, you know, some of the emails from Hillary Clinton on the you know, the server of their personal laptop is doing another investigation. This opens everything back up again. So, you know, the Russians didn't do yeah, this, everything. This, 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 this is part of my favorite and uh, this is one of my favorite under-remembered facts, but if it weren't for Anthony Weiner, you would not get the Comey letter and arguably you would not end up uh, with, with Trump winning. You might end up- yeah, And as the, the Russians said, yeah. we didn't have anything to do with that. Right, right, right. Yeah, I yeah. hope I've explained this, but I mean, it's complex. And I think that this is a problem about why people find it so confusing and they kind of just, you know, um, zone out of it because I all think that, well, what could possibly have happened to you? Because there are so many different dimensions, but these two facets of, you know, the, the fact of Russian intervention and then the impact that has in politics. But then the other thing that they didn't actually affect the outcome of the election are important to keep in mind in terms of, you know, kind of who got elected. Right, right. Certainly the, the Facebook groups and all of those kinds of things yeah. did not in any, in any very meaningful way. Um, so you go into the administration, you're supposed to go and explain Mr. Putin to Mr. Trump. That doesn't happen. Um, tell us about your time in the administration and how you are able to stick to your principles and you know wind up as really one of a few people who come out of the administration being able to hold the heads up high. Uh, I mean, the pressure to shut your mouth, to go along um, must have been enormous. So, so, so how were you able, First of all, how are you thinking at each moment about what's the benefit of staying in versus what's a potential risk substantively in terms of becoming complicit with very bad things, but also personally? Um, and, and how were you able to, you know, take a courageous decision to testify against Donald Trump and to, uh, uh, you know, please stand up for your professional values in an impeachment trial under very difficult circumstances? Well, look, first of all, I went in purely focused on the national security aspects of this and trying to deal with, you know, what I also did see was this 
you know, kind of multifaceted um, uh, problem, but determined to focus on that and bearing uppermost in my mind at all times about all the risks that you outlined, because plenty of people, you know, um, gave me their thoughts on it. Some said that they wouldn't speak to me again, you know, by making that decision because, you know, they were very convinced that actually um, Trump had been elected by the Russians' intervention. And also, I'm guessing they're speaking to you again, or? Yeah, a couple of them have not, and um, you know that they, and also the, you know, I guess they're stuck to their, you know, points as well, and the nature of the man himself, which I was aware of. I mean, I was worried about that as well, but I was more worried about, you know, kind of the implications of what the Russians had done, and could we mitigate this, and could we push back and make sure it didn't happen again? And also, I had all of Europe in my portfolio, and there was so many tensions. I mean, you know, I worked uh, in the past on Turkey, you know, obviously you, there's Ukraine. The, uh, the Caucasus, you know, and all of Europe, you know, NATO and the European Union, and, you know, the UK in my portfolio. And, you know, I kind of felt uh, this incumbent upon me to try to step up there and, you know, do whatever I could. There was an off going on, we had Brexit and, you know, crises on all fronts, Syria, you know, Turkey and, the, you know, the Kurdish um, in standoff with the United States. I mean, I came in just as the United States had made the decision to back, you know, the Kurds in the fight against ISIS, for example, which was rupturing the relationship with Turkey. I spent as much time on Turkey and sometimes more than on Russia, for example, or some of the other European issues. Questions about the future of NATO. So many different things on the agenda here. And I also gave myself a limited time frame. When I'd gone into the government before the National Intelligence Office, um, as a National Intelligence Office and National Intelligence Council, I had um, had a four year limit. It was two years with the um, opportunity to, or the possibility of extending for another two years. But that was an absolute limit. Um, and Brookings actually was not sure that they would allow me to go that you know, next leave because you know, Brookings usually went two year terms. And I ended up doing three and a half years, but coming back earlier than the, the end of the four. And in this case, I decided to take a proper leave from Brookings, unpaid leave, obviously, and um, try to limit myself to two years and then to leave. So that I wouldn't, I thought at the time, then get so embroiled in the domestic politics and wouldn't get smelled up in the campaign. And well, of course, pretty early on, I realized that was naive, that this was a permanent campaign and I was gonna to have to tread very carefully. And that I should be you know, ready to leave you know, if I became part of the problem, which was another warning that I had from Martin Indyk, you know, one of my close associates, one of my bosses from Brookings. While you still can be part of a solution, stay, but if you become part of the problem, you've got to leave. And by 2019, it was very clear there were problems on every front. Um, I wanted to kind of leave the position in a way that I could hand it on to others. I got out just that week before the fateful phone call. But look, you know, I took an oath to the constitution. I was very focused on the issue of national security, trying to do the job. And when I then got called up to testify, there was no question that I would do so. Because all the way through, I had been speaking out behind the scenes, you know, to my immediate, you know, kind of uh, chain of command, which, you know, I had the good fortune of having people like uh, General H.R. McMaster and Ambassador John Bolton, who were patriots and, you know, who were pretty principal people, you know, they're, um, you know, obviously very different people, but others that I work with, who were detailed from across the government, people who had been in previous administrations, and who were all doing their jobs. Now, you know, some people are very strong agendas you know i think people are very familiar with ambassador bolton and you know many of his views but the man is a patriot and you know was dedicated to upholding the constitution the principles and so you know i was pretty sure that i could speak and speak freely but of course i was under you know political assault from in, within the domestic environment the entire time i was there and that was surreal but i have to say that i was prepared for it Partly because of my studies of the Soviet Union and Russia and, you know, seeing the kinds of things that people had had to, you know, it was like being in the middle of Stalin purges at different points, but I wasn't being sent to the gulag, you know, I wasn't being, you know, kind of uh, drawn up in front of, a, you know, kind of a firing squad. And I also, you know, was able to dig deep into my own childhood and the resilience that I'd built up there in very harsh and difficult circumstances, remembering where I'd come from. So at all points that was uppermost in my mind. I wasn't in there for the perks and the privileges and I wasn't in there for any political purpose other than to try to, you know, kind of push back against what happened. And I was also focused on trying to figure out, could we, you know, kind of manage this confrontation with Russia and put it in a different footing? 
you know, going back to the early reason I first started studying Russian, was there something that we could do to get ourselves off this track? I mean, gosh, we're still in, you know, one heck of a situation with Russia over Ukraine. And this is a very dangerous relationship. And how do we manage this? And I was trying, you know, to keep myself focused on that. I did not, I have to say, expect the domestic politics to go off in the directions that they did. I mean, I had a let's just say a real shock to the system by how dirty American politics is. I think I saw those, you know, smart naive, having never been in a political campaign, never been so close to the political bus furnace as others who would warn me have been, you know, just to how, how this would unfold. I mean, there, there is so much corruption and, you know, so much just private gain, you know, uppermost, you know, kind of in our, our politics at this particular juncture that, you know, we are really repeating you know, many of uh, the things that we've seen in many different settings. And look, I mean, it's going to take people standing up for the principles of democracy to push back against this. And now that I've found myself with this platform that I never anticipated, you know, when I was called up to, um, you know, be a fact witness of the impeachment trial, I'm going to continue to stand up and speak out because, you know, I feel the future of the country is at stake. It's so obviously at stake that I have to say something, just as I had to, I felt going in 2016 to do something in response to, you know, the Russian intervention in the presidential campaign. Um, so, so, you, so you spoke to the fact that it's been your mission from the beginning to think, how can we manage this relationship with Russia? How can we make sure that uh, what was then a Cold War doesn't turn hard? Um, today, it continues to have a very adversarial relation uh, with Russia, and of course, we have what some people are calling a new Cold War with China, uh, right. and certainly the prospect of, uh, you know, a, a rivalry that is likely to last uh, for the foreseeable future and that could turn very dangerous. So, um, you know, should we resign ourselves to the fact that the basic uh, outlines of international relations for the next decades are going to continue, uh, are going to, 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 to consist of significant great power rivalry. Um, and you know, what do you think American foreign policy can do uh, beyond the next few years of the Biden administration, uh, beyond perhaps this decade, um, to, to manage that in a way which allows us to stand up for democracy and human rights at home uh, and where appropriate abroad? Um, but but doesn't uh, exacerbate the danger of things going yeah. very, very badly wrong. Yeah, look, we're going to have to be very much focused on crisis management, um, as we were during the Cold War, sadly, just by, you know, as you said, this kind of um, emergence of a new forms of great power competition and rivalry. I mean, it's not where we thought we would be, but it's where we are, at least for now. Now, I do think that there are some things that we can do. First of all, I mean, we've always succeeded in the past, not just by the force of our arms, but the force and the power of our example. And our example hasn't been great <laughs> of late. And I mean, that's not just the United States, but, you know, kind of the West, you know, Europe, um, in other words, you know, more broadly, um, you know, you're sitting in Germany now where a very interesting experiment in coalition government is underway, and they have been in the past. And, you know, you have the SPD that ran on a campaign of mutual respect, which is extraordinarily interesting. So I think, you know, that this in itself could be, you know, kind of a path forward. Let's see. I mean, we don't know. It's very early days. I mean, incredibly early days. They've only just started. So it's far too early to be able to say how, you know, they will succeed at this. But certainly in the United States, our domestic and foreign policy become entwined together. The, you know, our poor handling of the COVID and a pandemic, not that everybody else has been doing particularly well either, uh, the nature of our domestic politics, you know, the insurrection of uh, January 6th of 2021, uh, you know, the uh, partisan and uh, nature and polarization of our politics, you know, the need for evident political reconciliation in some form. If we can revitalize our democracy, this democracy summit has been looking at this as well, you know, I think that's going to be part of it to show by our example that we can also reform ourselves and, you know, kind of give people stakes back in the system again. But the other, you know, issues is trying to kind of find a new framing. You know, we are actually all in a state of common existential threat. We just don't seem to have got it through to everybody. The pandemic ought to have concentrated the minds. It hasn't yet. But, you know, these successive waves and variants may do that. You know, emergence and fears of um, uh, new uh, infectious diseases, the next pandemics. You know, we've got to do better than this as an international, you know, global community to respond to it. And climate change. You know, we are starting to now see that, you know, it's highly unlikely that we are going to reach any of the targets that we set up, you know, kind of 26, 30 years ago, 
COP26. I mean, we've been having these climate uh, discussions now for the first part of three decades. We're not doing well. We are not going to um, stem the temperature increases, so we're going to have to mitigate. And we're going to have to adapt and we're going to have to kind of build a resilience. It's going to be global because we're all in this together. And everywhere is going to have refugees and climate, you know, migrants um, and climate disasters. We see this. And so I'm hoping that, you know, we can frame this for the future and start to kind of at least take some small steps to work together. Um, you know, we're trying to do that with China uh, and maybe we can reframe this. I mean, who cares, you know, what um, kind of country you are, your great power competition, if you're all laid waste by some climate disaster, right? You know, kind of uh, Mother Earth is not kind of saying, oh gosh, you know, you're in the authoritarian camp, the democratic camp, camp as, you know, kind of ice caps melt and global, you know, oceanic currents uh, shift, etc. You know, so, you know, and, and climate uh, patterns, it's irrespective, right? <laughs> you know, which part of the world you're coloured, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, this is like, you know, the kind of the, the blue for democracy and the green for you know this and you know everything else yeah so um you know we're all in this together and hopefully you know kind of over you know some considerable period of time maybe it'll take some more disasters you know to push this along but i you know i am kind of more hopeful that we can chip away at this and you know we're about to have another major economic dislocation of the kind that i experienced as a kid you know kind of in the 70s and 80s we're moving towards artificial intelligence you know, a different, uh, you know, kind of form of economy. We're moving towards new green technologies. China is in the forefront of this. We're all going to have to catch up. So a whole generation of people are going to be experiencing, you know, a very different world uh, from the one we're in now. So it's not just, very satisfying, but it's a combination of crisis management and then trying to sort of reframe the global debate. Yeah, no, that's, that, that seems exactly right. Um, just as a, as a final question, I want to bring it back to the beginning of a conversation, which is uh, your thoughts on, on opportunity and the way in which uh, a lack of opportunity has led to many of our problems in politics today. Um, how can we fix that? Um, how can we make sure that uh, the, the forgotten people, the forgotten regions, the forgotten groups uh, feel that they have enough opportunity, enough respect, enough of a stake in the society uh, that you know, hopefully we can uh, turn a page from 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 this very dangerous populist politics. Well, this is also multi-dimensional. It's not just in the realm of public policy and the role of government um, in breaking down barriers or you know coming up with legislation for new infrastructure, for example, physical and in terms of infrastructure of opportunity through education and public health. You know, for example, it's also a kind of uh, private sector. Even at the individual level, I mean, I describe in the book things that you and I and others can, you know, take, you know, for example, things we can do. Um, I think, you know, universities can play an awfully important role in think tanks, you know, in kinds of new um, ideas, uh, new approaches to education. Philanthropy um, has an important role to play. You know, we've seen this from some of the major donors like McKinsey Scott, the ex-wife of Jeff Bezos, you know, from um, Amazon, giving literally billions of dollars, you know, where to um, uh, university and uh, uh, higher education institutions that um, particularly cater to people from underprivileged backgrounds, you know, kind of historically black universities and colleges in the United States, for example, uh, those for first generation or people who want to uh, first generation going to college, but also people who want to reskill and retrain, you know, for example. Um, we have to work very hard at uh, of removing the barriers, the discrimination on basis of race, ethnicity, religion, gender, you know, disability, you know, for example, uh, all the kinds of uh, ways in which people allow their biases to shape their hiring, you know, making sure that human resources departments in um, every, you know, private sector and public sector environment are making, you know, sure to give people an equal chance and a shot at a job. And a lot of it is an investment in early uh, childhood education, investment in children, you know, for example, we have all these debates about um, child, you know, tax credits or direct payments. I mean, I am the beneficiary of direct, you know, child benefits uh, when I was growing up in the UK. I mean, it helped keep my family out of abject poverty. My family were uh, well beneath the poverty line, but these, um, you know, payments made a difference. You know, kind of thinking about how we can um, help people get um, education and training, all different um, uh, phases in their um, career paths without going into um, massive debt. 
you know, kind of uh, work um, sponsorship, you know, corporations working uh, with universities for retraining and reskilling, you know, for example, more grants and uh, subsidization, you know, for people who are first generation or from marginalized communities or communities historically and traditionally being discriminated against. There's so many different ways in which you can approach that. But I think the question is really, how do we put it together in a comprehensive way? You know, I suggest various things in the book that other people have come up with, you know, domestic development agencies, for example, that, you know, kind of also take best practices of things we've done um, in international settings. There's all kinds of things. Having discussions about this, you know, like that we're having on your podcast and the way that you frame all of your debates are kind of, engaging with people so we help better inform people about um, the complexities of these issues and have a rational civil debate about things so that people can make up their own minds that they're not being subject to disinformation you know for example i think there's all all important elements everything is a kind of a building block to this and i said in the book i try to pull a lot of different things together and then come up with some practical suggestions of what individuals can do mentoring youth you know volunteering and everything from your local library, a bit difficult during COVID, but, you know, for community programs, for example. And if you've got the means, you know, kind of giving donations to food banks and, um, you know, kind of groups that, you know, help un underprivileged kids, for example. Fiona Hill, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you so much, Yasha. It's just really been a privilege and thank it's really enjoyed um, having the discussion with you. Thanks so much for having me.